Welcome, and thank you for joining this presentation, Digital Learning Transformation Strategy. We have two chat options, one in the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize the questions for our speakers, we would like for you to use the chat in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both, the, both of the chats for your questions and your comments. Please participate in the session by sharing your thoughts, posting links or resources, and or asking your questions. If you are asking a question to the speakers, we do ask that you put a question mark at the beginning of the question. This makes it easier for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Jessica Roland Williams is the director of Every Learner Everywhere. As director, she provides leadership and vision for the network and leads the operation of the network strategy. Prior to this role, Jessica served as the Completion Grant Initiative Project Director for the University Innovation Alliance. She also worked as Project Director in Georgia State University's Office of the Senior Vice President of Student Success. During her time at Princeton University, Jessica served four years as a diversity fellow at Princeton University's Office of Education of Academic Affairs and Diversity and was honored with the Patricia Y. Johnson Memorial Service Award by the Association of Princeton Black Alumni in recognition for her high levels of performance and service to the university. Jessica has devoted her career to helping institutions better serve marginalized students. Jessica earned her bachelor's degree in biology from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and earned both an MA and PhD in molecular biology from Princeton University. Our other guest speaker is Patricia O'Sullivan, to the rest of us known as Patty. Uh, joined, she joined Every Learner Everywhere team in September of 2020. She has worked in higher education since 2000 as an instructor, a student advisor, faculty development specialist, instructional designer, and grant manager. In her role as content manager, she works with network partners to develop, update, and curate every learner resources. She taught world religions at the University of Mississippi for 14 years and currently teaches health ethics in the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy. She holds a BA in communications from UMass Amherst, an MA in theology from Assumption College, and an MA in history from the University of Mississippi. I am going to hand it over to Jessica at this point. Hey everyone, it's so great to be here with you today. Thank you guys for joining our session. I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit today about the work that we're doing at Every Learner Everywhere and how we're thinking about digital learning transformation. Um, one thing that we know is that over the last year and a half, we've seen tremendous strides in how institutions are prioritizing digital transformation um, at the same time that they're grappling with how to address you know, systemic racism and other inequities that have been brought to the forefront because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we know some of the good news is that many instructors are reporting an increased positive perception of digital learning and more frequent and embedded uses of digital resources, especially in introductory courses. And um, we've also heard that faculty are Instructors are uh, feeling an increased exposure to the lived experiences of many of their students. Um, which is another positive and new development um, in the way we're thinking about education. But there are also challenges that have come along with these changes. We've heard that instructors um, are growing concerned about equity and moral issues related to the use of digital tools. Um, we've certainly heard a lot about, you know, concerns about access to technology and access to broadband and Wi-Fi for certain students. And then we're also hearing things around the field about loss of engagement, especially in digital learning spaces. And so one thing that we know is that research shows that student performance in gateway courses or introductory courses are a direct predictor of retention and student success. And we also know that, you know, Black and Latinx and Indigenous and other minoritized student groups have historically had higher DFWI rates in those gateway courses. And the result of that has been that these same students historically have earned fewer course credits and um, have had an increased likelihood of leaving college without a degree. And I think we can all agree that, you know, during these really trying times, we've seen that trend be exacerbated. And some of those most more vulnerable students have become even more vulnerable. 
Um, one thing that we believe at Every Learner Everywhere is that if we can improve the learning experiences provided in Gateway courses, then we can increase course success rates for Black and Latinx and Indigenous and other minoritized student groups. And we also believe that digital courseware and digital learning tools can be a catalyst for improving those course outcomes for marginalized students. And the way that courseware, digital learning tools and courseware can be catalyst is because it can enable faculty to adapt instructions to students' needs. So, you know, pers provide personalized learning experiences um, and also promote active and collaborative learning and provide learners with actionable and timely feedback, which is something that we've heard, you know, and we've learned through our own research is so important to the student success. Our network also believes that when we improve the learning experiences provided in Gateway courses um, through the implementation of digital learning, then we can also improve those success rates for minoritized students. And we know that when faculty and institutions have the right tools and knowledge to implement digital learning effectively, right, keyword there is effectively, um, that the result is an improved learning experience for all students. Um, and that's even in the middle of a pandemic, right? Uh, one other thing that I want to highlight that we believe, because I think it's an important distinguishing factor of our network, um, is that we, be we believe that technology alone is unlikely to bring about the improved course outcomes we seek, right? In our network, we refer to that as techno-solutionism. So we don't believe that, you know, the inequities that we see in, in society and in higher ed are going to be solved with simply throwing technology at the problem. But we do believe um, that if we leverage technology and also incorporate evidence-based teaching practices and address the effective and interpersonal and situational challenges that Black and Latinx and Indigenous and poverty-affected students experience, um, then we can provide learning experiences that really do serve the needs of these populations that have been historically marginalized. Um, so the work that we do, you know, is, you've been looking at this visual the whole time, it's really right at the intersection of these three circles. So we work at the intersection of digital courseware, learning technology and sustainability, evidence-based teaching and gateway courses, and equity and racial justice in higher education. Next slide. So I wanna talk a little bit about who we are. Um, Every Letter Everywhere is a network of 12 partner organizations, and we work together collaboratively to help faculty and institutions improve how they serve Black, Latinx, and Indigenous, and poverty-affected and first-generation students through the implementation of digital learning. Um, the partners within our network work collaboratively um, to help colleges and universities pursue solutions that are equity-focused, student-centered, faculty-powered, and institution-driven. Um, our partners represent leaders and innovators in teaching and learning. Um, as you're looking at this graphic, I'm sure you recognize a lot of these organizations. And we work together by providing the field with tools and services and resources that support the implementation of equity-focused digital learning strategies. We also, an important pillar of the work that we do is to work with network partners who share our equity-first perspective and focus and are willing to advocate for marginalized communities and value diversity and network representation. Next slide. So a little bit about our history. Um, our work began in 2017 um, and our network was launched initially to increase the field's adoption and awareness of digital tools and digital learning tools and strategy. In the beginning, the very early stages of our work, we were focused on building a network and defining our mission and our vision and bringing in our partner organizations. And um, most of our partners were organizations that had existing relationships within um, the Gates community, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation community. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is one of our, is our, our major funder. Um, these are also organizations that had already de demonstrated a commitment to advancing digital learning and higher education. And so when we first started, our network focused on, um, started with the focus on adaptive courseware. And one of our first major projects was to support 12 institutions in the redesign of introductory courses using digital tools. And so um, between fall of 2019 and fall of 2020, <clears throat> this adaptive implementation project um, proceeded and we were able to support um, 404, I'm sorry, 404 faculty at those 12 institutions in um, redesigning 176 courses 
um, and supporting 21,000 students. Um, so that project was really successful and we were able to scale our work significantly. Since that time, our network has grown and we've expanded our focus beyond adaptive course or implementation. And we currently understand digital learning as a broad range of content and communication tools, as well as curricular models, design strategies, and services that personalize instruction for students in blended and online learning environments. And we've continued to expand our reach and our ability to serve institutions. And as you can see on this slide here, we have now served over 500 institutions in all 50 states and in seven countries. Uh, one more thing about that slide um, is that, you know, one thing that we've learned is that the evidence, the evidence from our work and work in the field has demonstrated that, you know, active and adaptive learning really does have the potential to improve outcomes for marginalized students. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, we are really excited about the ways that we're able to scale this, um, not just in the U.S., but even outside of the U.S. Next slide. So I spoke a little bit about um, our focus on equity, right? And there are a lot of ways that we incorporate equity in our work, um, including um, focusing on who we bring into our network, who, who our partners are, focusing on how we work, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but one of the important ways that we've centered equity and centered student voice in our work is through our student fellowship. Um, as many of you know, if you've been in higher ed long enough, um, you know, we have a terrible culture of solving problems for populations of students without ever talking to them directly about, you know, what they need for success or what they're struggling with or how we can support them in removing barriers. Um, there's a popular South African mantra that I share with my network all the time, which is, you know, nothing about us without us. And that's something that, you know, we have tried to embrace and embody, right? Um, we know that we can't do work for students um, without incorporating them and their perspectives deeply in the work that we do. And so uh, this work, the student fellowship work, stemmed from um, a partnership that we launched with an organization called Global Minded. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this organization and also the Equity Project. Um, we wanted to know and understand how students were um, how students were dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and transitioning to remote learning. Um, and so instead of conducting kind of the typical run-of-the-mill student survey, um, we decided to do a study where we stepped down with students, um, and not just any students, but specifically marginalized students. So we sought out, you know, Indigenous students and Black students and rural students and veterans and returning adults. Um, and we found, you know, we sought out students at 47 institutions and we sat with them for two hours in focus groups, asking them open-ended questions about their experiences with digital and online learning. And the feedback that we got from that, those students was so rich and enlightening. Um, some of the things that we learned were, of course, that you know, 80% of the students said they disliked online learning right at the time. And this was, of course, right at the, the, the height of the pandemic. But we didn't want to just stop there. All right, we really wanted to dig deeper and understand why would, you know, what's going on? What's going on with these students? Um, we found that they felt overwhelmed, um, even though they were wanting to prioritize their education. We found that 90% of them said that they were comfortable with technology in the classroom and they saw it as a huge benefit, but that their instructors also often struggled with using the technology and using the remote learning techniques in ways that felt effective in teach in, in learning. Um, we also heard that the students were recognizing the equity disparities. They felt like there was inconsistency in internet access for faculty and students and the availability of laptops. And they also shared with us about the difficulty of finding quiet working spaces. Um, one thing that was very clear out of this work that we did with Global Minded was that our students knew what they wanted and needed to be successful. Um, some of the examples of things that they cited specifically were that they wanted diversity in the methods used to facilitate learning in the remote environment. They wanted more options, more than just lecture and video and simulation. And I'm sorry, more than just lecture. They wanted videos and simulations and Q&A sessions, and they wanted innovative ways to engage. It was also striking to us that our students really placed the responsibility on their institutional leaders and their community to ensure that all students receive the benefits of using technology to learn. 
And so we really took that charge to heart and we didn't just listen to those students, but we brought them in um, and we continue to work with them in everything that we're doing as a network. So last slide, next slide. So one of the most important goals of our work in supporting institutions is translating the why of equity and digital learning to how and to how. Um, I think, you know, we've all gone through, we're all in different places in our equity journey, but I think that, you know, along that journey, we're all beginning to have a greater understanding and sense of the why, the why this is important, the why, you know, our students need this additional support or why the why we need to rethink you know, how we implement tools and maybe employ different teaching practices. But the most difficult part of that is not always, you know, getting over the why hurdle, but really understanding the how. Um, I'm sure many people even in this, in this room today might have really good intentions, right? But just may not always have the information to know what to do with those good intentions um, and how to translate, you know, that those good intentions into good practice, right? And so that's really what, what our network is striving to support faculty and institutions in doing. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, one, of course, is through designing and delivering services to institutions, so providing technical assistance. Um, the second is developing resources. And we have a number of resources that we can cite um, and share with you. Of course, you're always welcome to go to our website and look at our re resource tab. And then lastly, um, a way that we do this is through sharing expertise and insights, both across our organization. So between those, those 12 um, organizations that um, you see listed here, but also with the field more broadly. Um, and so one of the resources that we recently developed um, is uh, called the Impact Toolkit. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to learn more about that specific resource. Um, and talk, and Patty O'Sullivan, who's joining me on the call today, is going to really walk us through some of the strategies that are included in that resource about how we can turn, you know, that why of equity work into how um, within an academic department. So without further ado, Patty, I'm going to pass the baton over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Let's see, okay. So I'm going to actually backtrack. I'm going to talk about the impact toolkit, but I want to talk about kind of the um, the mother document, <laughs> um, the asset um, called Getting Started with Equity. And, and I have to say, I've been with Every Learner a little over a year, um, and, and I think it was my first day working with the Every Learner Network that Jessica said to me, we really need an asset. We, we need some kind of guidance for faculty and administrators to, to know how to get started. I mean, infusing your department, infusing your class with equity can seem really overwhelming and people need to have a place to start. What are some things I can do immediately? What are some things that I can do in a um, you know, semester to semester update of my class? And then what are some longer term goals that I can have for equity and maybe a more major course revision? Um, and so that's that's kind of the idea we started with with this um, with this resource. The other thing, the other part of this that, that really informed um, how we designed this resource is um, I work at the University of Mississippi, and um, I have a lot of contact with department chairs and faculty, and you know we have our own um, diversity, equity, and inclusivity workshops and. I would always hear faculty and department chairs leave these workshops saying, I love all these ideas. I, I, I learned a lot. Um, I'm on a journey now, but I still don't know what to do. Just tell me what to do. And so we were hearing from people that they really wanted practical guidance um, and transforming their teaching. And so that's where getting started with equity came from. Um, so we designed, we made the very conscious decision to um, have the audience for this asset be um, academic department chairs. Um, we, we very specifically wanted to kind of target leadership as our, as our audience because we, we felt that when you, when you ask faculty to do this work, um, a faculty are very eager to do this work, but 
it can be isolating. You know, when, when you're the only person in your cohort of, of maybe four or five instructors that all teach multiple sections of the same course, if you're the only one doing this work and the others aren't interested, um, that can hold you back or that can feel isolating. It can be discouraging. And so we really felt that if we ask department chairs to look at their programs, to look at the, the teaching that they're encouraging and that they're evaluating in their departments, um, this would be kind of a more communal effort. And, you know, racism and inequity is a communal thing. And so it can only be undone if we approach it as a community. Um, you know, individuals don't cause racism, communities cause racism and where the communities can undo it, individuals can't undo it. And so that was kind of the thinking behind this. Um, making making it be an asset for department chairs. The other thing that we did was we really wanted to focus on teaching. I know there's a lot of issues in academic departments around hiring and around tenure and promotion, around equal pay, um, all kinds of employment issues, and we just didn't feel qualified to address those. So this is this is a resource that is very specifically around the um, what's happening in the classroom, what's happening with the curriculum. Um, so there are three parts to this, this uh, resource guide. Um, the first one is just walking leadership through an, an equity audit. I mean, how, how can you do an equity audit of your department? Again, how do you know where to begin? If you don't even know what what the barriers are for students, if you don't even know what's wrong and what's tripping students up, then you can't address it. Um, and as Jessica said, we were really intentional about letting department leaders know and faculty know at every step of the way, you must be including students. It's not just a nice thing to ask them, hey, what do you think of this? They have to be included um, because students are the ones who can tell you this policy is problematic because, you know, we those of us who work in departments, we wouldn't necessarily see that. We're not on the receiving end of that. So it, we really need students to, to tell us um, where, where, where are our practices and policies tripping you up. Um, so the departmental um, equity audit was the first part of this asset. The second part is, let me see if I can forward this. Okay, whoops, went too far. There we go. The second part is um, teaching practices uh, for educational equity. And, and this is, it's aimed at department chairs, but faculty can use this part of the guide as well. Um, we break down teaching practices into four, what we call buckets. Um, and, and a lot of them are based on this sense of um, building a sense of belonging with students and then also approaching students um, with an anti-deficit mindset that we're not trying to fix the students, we're trying to fix our teaching practices, we're trying to fix our curriculum so that we're meeting our students where they're at. Um, so the first bucket, if you will, is creating a welcoming and supportive classroom climate. If students feel like they belong, if students feel like their instructor really cares about them, the research shows that they are much more um, likely to be successful in that class. Um, and just to say also, every single one of these suggestions is based on research. They're all evidence-based teaching practices. Um, so creating a welcoming and supportive classroom climate. You know, I have a, a story of a student. Um, I was running some focus groups with students a few years ago, and something one student said to me has always stuck with me. He talked about how on the first day of class, and he was a transfer student, so it was his first day at the university. Um, his first day of his first class at this university, and the, it was a STEM class, and the teacher's first words were, half of you will fail. And he said, it just was so discouraging. It made him just want to quit, get up and walk out. He didn't, but he said, you know, it, it just sometimes feel like y'all have set this up to be an academic hazing ritual. And I, I just, that always stuck with me, academic hazing ritual. You know, we talk about bullying and hazing in the Greek system and, and in housing and, and with students, and we talk about how problematic it is. And yet here's a student saying, you're running your classes 
in the same way, you're 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 putting us through the gauntlet. You're 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 trying to see which one of us will survive, and and that's that's not what education should be about. That was really a, a moment for me. So creating a welcoming, supportive classroom climate, letting students know you belong in this classroom, you belong at this university, you belong in this discipline, um, and I'm here to help you. I'm not here to fail you or weed you out. Um, there's a lot more specificity to this. I won't go through all of the individual strategies. Um, you can get the guide <laughs> in the link provided in the chat. Um, another big bucket was representing students in the curriculum and in the classroom. Um, students are much more likely to be engaged in the curriculum if they feel like it's about them, if they can see themselves in it. Um, and it's not just you know, changing the names of the people in the examples so that their names, you know, that reflect your student population um, or changing the images in your PowerPoints. It's, it's also showing them that the content is relevant to their lives. Um, Norma, um, who is our excellent moderator, she ran a series called Strategies for Success this past summer, and she brought in um, one of our experts, um, our, our experts network that we had, um, which she also ran. And um, one of these experts teaches biology and she teaches a course on environmental biology. And she had this great presentation where she talked about how climate change is really affecting um, poor communities, communities of color, um, you know, and, and that, and she invited the students to kind of talk about how is climate change affecting your family, your neighborhood, your home, um, and, and that, that just level of engagement, did she cover everything in the biology curriculum? She did, um, but she also did it in a way that was really, really meaningful to the students because she invited them to be almost co-creators of that content as well. And so that's, that's, that's the deeper side of representation. Um, course design, this, this, any of you out there who are instructional designers know that course design can really matter um, when it comes to having an equitable course. Um, you just think about the cognitive load it takes when you're trying to use technology and it's confusing, it's not intuitive, there are too many clicks, you don't know where to find things, or you think everything's supposed to be in this one folder, but then you have to go externally to all these different places on the web and it's confusing. And so if you, at if you can work, if you're faculty and you can work with an instructional designer or have an instructional designer review your course, you definitely should take advantage of that. Because again, design, it's not something that we're, we're taught as faculty, right? We're not taught how to design courses, digital courses especially. Um, and so there are experts out there to help us. And um, we can really reduce the cognitive load on our students so they can spend their intellectual energy on learning the content of our courses rather than spending their intellectual energy just trying to navigate the course and figure out what to do and where things are. Um, the last bucket that we had in this section two of getting started with equity is teaching practices um, and assessment strategies that benefit minoritized students. These strategies benefit all students, um, but when you benefit minoritized students, you raise up all students. Um, and again, these, these are, I won't go through all of these um, you know, in a nitpicky way, but two of the biggies are um, moving away from the lecture or breaking up the lecture and, and allowing students to be more active in their learning, um, allowing students to be the one that do the work in the class. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and then also having more frequent assessments, not having two or three or four high stakes assessments where students will cram the information, they'll take the test, maybe be successful. And, and again, the research shows if they do it that way, we know that within two hours, they forget about 85% of what they've crammed. Um, so it's we even know that that's not a good way to make sure students know something. We just, it's a way to measure them memorizing something. Um, so again, this is part two of getting started with equity. Part three is um, we really dive into discipline specific briefs. And so it's, it's discipline briefs. And right now we have nine briefs in five different disciplines. Um, and those are psychology, English composition, chemistry, biology, and mathematics. Um, 
And so these were written by faculty across the country. Um, they did research and so they talk about what are the problems in this discipline specific to equity? Um, what are some solutions for that? What are some ways that you can overcome that in your teaching? And then what are some resources for further reading, further viewing, um, listening to help you get a better sense of how in a particular discipline you can make your teaching more equitable? So that's getting started with equity. Um, now I'm going to move on to the impact framework. Um, this is this kind of grew out of the um, departmental audit. Um, this is a, a framework that was developed by uh, Jeremiah and Rachel Sims, and um, they have a um, an equity organization, um, a training organization called Rooted in Love Education. And um, so they created this impact framework and they very graciously allowed us to use it and to share it with you all um, for free. Um, so we modified it specifically again for our purposes in the Getting Started with Equity Guide. Um, but the impact framework is a way to take departmental leadership through um, very specific policies and practices in a department that might impact um, student progression, student enrollment, student success. Um, and so let me just show you the impact framework here. Um, every letter stands for something, but um, the impact framework basically asks you to evaluate all the policies and practices in your department against um, these questions. Is the policy or practice innovative? Um, does it move us away from oppressive practices? Is it mindful? Um, does it account for the whole student experience? Um, you know, are, are we, a lot of times faculty, especially pre-pandemic would say, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on in my students' lives and that doesn't matter. They need to be here for class, yada, yada, yada. Well, during the pandemic, we realized that actually what students are going through in their lives and their home situation really does matter. And we really do need to care about that. Um, is the practice or is the policy purposeful? Um, does, it, does it challenge the status quo? Is it actionable? Um, is it something that we can do something, we can make changes? Um, does it call out um, deeply entrenched anti-Blackness and other forms of oppression? Is it caring? Does it come from a place of caring for students? Um, and finally, is it transformative? Is this policy or practice something that helps us uh, reimagine education and, and the student experience of education. Whoops. All right. Sorry about that. Um, and so I wanted to just say the impact framework doesn't just say, look at your policies. It actually gives examples of policies. And this was a really fun part of creating this resource is that we worked with students and we asked them to walk us through just your, your daily, you know, your daily life. And then even just a semester, what are the policies departmentally that you are having trouble with? And so our student reviewers gave us a lot of ideas on things that we wouldn't have thought of. And again, that's why it's so important to center student voice when you're doing any of this work. Um, but they talked to us about departmental policies, particularly ones around um, progression in, in a certain program. Um, they talked about uh, departmental policies around textbooks, around um, bringing in speakers, funding organizations. Um, so, so it wasn't just classroom type things. It was, it was policies that made these students feel welcome in the department and in the discipline. Again, very important. They talked about classroom policies that affected them, um, policies around attendance, policies around late work, policies around academic integrity, um, policies around grading, um, and again, textbooks. And then they also talked about this, this third category of policies, um, physical spaces in the department. Um, what was the signage around physical spaces? Were the physical spaces accessible, uh, physically accessible um, for students? Um, what did departmental physical spaces look like? When you, know, when you walk into a department, maybe you'll see a list of um, department chairs or and, you know, portraits of them. Are they all white men? Or you see a department highlighting the, the research or the, the publications of faculty. Um, what, what are the topics of these and who's doing them? Or what are the artifacts that a department displays about itself? Are these things that make students feel welcome in the discipline and welcome in the department? 
Um, so these are two really exciting resources that we have. And again, like just to tap into what Jessica said, a way that the Every Learner Network is really helping institutions move from um, the why of doing this to the very practical how. And so if you read these resources, you really get a sense of here are some things I can do immediately. Here are some things I could do, um, like I said, in a semester update of my course. And then here are some long-term course revisions or departmental changes that we can make to um, become more equitable. And I'm going to hand it back over to um, Jessica. Sure, I think um, first we just wanna invite, thank you so much for joining again. We wanna invite you to connect with us and stay connected with us. Um, you can do that by following us on Twitter, subscribing to our newsletter, um, finding us on Facebook, going to our webpage, et cetera. Um, and I think with that, we will open the floor for any questions. Norma, I think you're muted. Okay, so All I right. go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> All right, I'll just go ahead and answer this one. So the question was what percentage of the 106 courses de developed in collaboration with the 12 colleges are STEM courses, and are these introductory courses being used only by those 12? participating colleges? That's a really great question. Um, and so Laura Da Vinci, who's my associate director, can get you the exact percentage of what percentage of those courses are STEM courses. So Laura, would you just put that in the chat? Um, I don't remember offhand, but she'd be able to quickly find that information. Um, but to, to answer your second question, are these courses only being used by those 12 participating colleges? And as far as we know for now, yes, um, you know, that project to scale those courses um, was disrupted a bit by COVID, right? Um, it took us about, um, you know, they, they, there was a semester of planning, there was a semester of implementing, and then in their kind of second uh, semester of implementing, you know, we, we were, it was spring, the spring of, what was it now? It's all a blur. Was it 2019 or <laughs> 2019, I think when, or 2020, um, you know, when we had the disruption of COVID. And so that really did, I think, um, kind of stunt some of that, the information sharing that we may have been able to do, um, you know, kind of outside of the institution, even within in the institution. Um, but um, we are hopeful that as we continue to learn more um, about, you know, the process that those institutions take, we can share some of that information more publicly. One thing that we have just started to release are a series of case studies um, that actually outline, you know, um, exactly what those institutions did and what the results were. Um, and that's one way that we're sharing that information, you know, more broadly with the field. And so that may be another interesting thing that we can link in the chat so you can read about, you know, more in depth what those, depth what those specific colleges did and what their experiences were, what they learned, um, what their challenges were, et cetera. Jessica, I'll just add because I happened to work at one of the institutions that was part of that original grant. Yeah. Um, yeah, in the beginning, a good many of them, because this was a four-year program, in the beginning, a good many of them were STEM courses because that's the, the um, adaptive course where a lot of it was just the early stages it was built for STEM courses. Um, and yet faculty get really, really creative in the humanities and the social sciences and really started using courseware for English composition, for history, sociology, psychology. Um, I know psychology was a course that was used about uh, across a lot of the, the institutions. Um, and, and yeah, these were all gateway courses. So um, while they weren't exactly the same, they all were 100, 200 level courses um, that, that usually had first year and second year students in them. Um, so they weren't like these highly specific upper level classes. These were just the usually the very large English composition, introduction to biology, you know, general chemistry kind of classes. 
So Jessica, I have a question for you now that I'm back up and running again. <laughs> um, as the leader of an organization that's designed to help or um, institutions of higher ed go through their transformative strategies, what are the, the top one or two challenges that you all have experienced um, working with these institutions to help them with that transformation, especially when there is that uh, focus on equity? Yeah, um, I, can, I can name two and they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and they are, you know, one, of course, is establishing buy-in um, across the institution, right, um, at multiple levels. Um, one thing that we've, one of our best practices within our network is to build cross-functional teams um, when it comes to implementing new tools and, um, and also making sure that, you know, that implementation really sticks. Um, you know, we're finding that, of course, you can kind of come in at the top, right, and kind of get buy-in and agreement maybe at the top, um, but sometimes it doesn't always trickle down, and then the same can happen in reverse, right, where you've got a lot of buy-in at the faculty level, um, but, you know, there's not a lot of support at the leadership level, um, and that, of course, impacts the amount of funding and professional development that's provided to support those initiatives. And so, um, you know, we find that um, best practice, of course, is to just build those cross-functional teams where you've got folks working across and up and down the chain um, to really uh, launch these, you know, innovative new ideas. And then the second issue that we run into all the time, of course, is sustainability, right? And um, again, I think those two things go hand in hand because sometimes when there's that lack of buy-in, it can be difficult to sustain an initiative. Um, of course, funding is another important factor in this. A lot of times institutions or faculty have funding to do a project um, and they are, you know, excited to, to engage as long as there's funding, but then when the funding runs out, if there's no additional support um, for that implementation project or that, that you know, the innovative product project, then oftentimes, you know, the projects um, discontinue, right? And so um, I think it's so critical that in building the implementation plan that there's also a plan for sustainability. Um, and of course, that's where having that buy-in at the top is really important so that you can, you know, is it secure funding or secure resources or, you know, whatever it is that's needed, um, you know, within that larger strategic plan to ensure that, you know, um, those innovations are sustained. So Patty, from an inside perspective, since you've been in the classroom up until recently or this semester even, um, what do you see as some of the challenges of bringing that equity mindedness into teaching and learning and, and part of that journey, that transformative journey that institutions are, are wanting to undertake, but what do you see as the challenges of from the inside? Well, <laughs> There's so much to say. I'm trying to reduce it down. <laughs> higher ed, change is hard, right? I'm, but higher ed wasn't built for equity. And so it's asking an institution that wasn't designed to do something to do, to do something else. Um, and that's, that's really hard because, again, you don't know where to begin. You don't know how do you start unraveling that thread? you know, and, and what things do you keep, what things can you get, get rid of? And, and even really well-intentioned progressive people um, can push back sometimes against traditions um, that they've come to expect or, or benefits that they've come to expect. And, and so I'm just thinking about faculty who, again, they really want to support their students, but when you say things like, um, you know, try to move away from lecture or try not to give high stakes exams, you know, there's some departments that might say, well, this is the way we've always done it. This is just the way it's done in this, in this discipline. Um, you know, and if we didn't do it this way, um, either, you know, it's, it's compromise the integrity of me as a scholar, because, you know, the way I'm seen as a scholar is also judged, you know, the way I'm seen as a teacher. And if I'm not rigorous as a teacher, People won't see me as a rigorous scholar. It could also, there's also pushback. Um, people won't see us as a, a rigorous department. People won't take us seriously as a department um, if we don't keep these traditional things that we've always kept. Um, and, then, and then there's just also um, 
you know, the wider, um, just they weren't trained that way, right? Um, or the infrastructure is not there, like, and, it, and then it's really hard. I mean, I, I run a faculty learning community and we have several faculty who have um, classroom individual sections that have over a hundred students. And, you know, they'll say, how am I supposed to assess every student individually and give personalized assessments? I've got, I don't have a graduate assistant to help me with grading. I have four sections over 100 students each. That's 400 students. I have to give high stakes multiple choice exams. Um, so, so there's, you know, there's there's that part of it um, that I that I think is is there. And then also, um, you know, there are other forces, um, you know, externally to to an institution. You know. Um, people, alumni sometimes don't want to see too much change. Um, people in the community don't necessarily want to see too much change. So, so it's really interesting that like you can simultaneously be an institution that's seen as a threat because you're progressive and, and you're trying to do all of these new things, but you're also seen as a threat because um, you, you're, you're not doing enough, right? That, that, that you're, you say you're progressive, but you're you're really not moving the needle, and that sometimes it seems like window dressing. And so, it, it's it's just to say it's complicated, and that's not to say that it can't be done, but um, it's really complicated. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think I, no, I just want to add one more thing because that's such a great point, and it's just the fact that so much of this work related to equity is so personal, and I think sometimes we for you know we we want to. And, and we all do this, right? Like that's work and this isn't my life and work is over here. And, and sometimes you know, for a lot of us actually our work is our lives. But um, but I think this is a this is a part of the work that you cannot disconnect your personal self from and your personal equity journey. And so I think being because it influences the way you're thinking about everything, it's influencing the way you're making decisions, it's influencing the way you interpret things, it's influencing the conclusions that you draw. Um, and so I think just keeping that, um, that your personal equity journey as a priority, I think it's just such an important piece that we don't talk about a lot in this work um, because it feels like it crosses over. But I think that, um, you know, it's, it's just so important to keep that in front of mind. So we have another question in chat. And I, I love this question. I, I have a lot to say about this, but I'm going to let you all talk, <laughs> answer first. Um, in technology, the best way to keep students interested in the subject is to have them do a lot of hands-on activities. Do digital transformation strategies lend themselves to well uh, lend themselves well to intrinsically hands-on activities? And what are the challenges, if any? I'm going to let you all tackle it because I have a soapbox to get on for that one. Well, I think Norma, I, I would love to hear your perspective here because I know, so what Norma hasn't shared is she has this incredible background in um, distance learning and science education. Um, and so I, I, I would actually love to hear your perspective on this one. <laughs> um, so my answer to not only in technology, but science and, you know, the, the whole STEM fields, whether you're doing science, um, if you're doing engineering, if you're doing technology, they do lend themselves to hands-on activities. You've just got to be creative and think outside of the box. We are so used to, you know, whether you're an engineering student or an engineering faculty or you're a physics professor, you're so used to saying your students have to come into the lab and, and work on this and get their hands on. Um, what we found when I was doing STEM work with digital learning from about 2005 till now is that those students can still get that hands-on authentic experience, um, whether they are physically in the laboratory or if they are doing it at home. So the, a lot of the fully online courses, everybody's like, oh, you can't teach biology and physics online. You can. There are lab kits that you can purchase or your students can purchase that give them that same tactile experience. Maybe they're not working with the $10,000 piece of equipment, whether it's a, you know, a an electron microscope, which is actually more than 10,000, but you know, you're not, they're not working on an electron microscope. They're not working on these big um, HPLC units and things like that. But most freshmen don't get to even look at those things other than in a book. Most freshmen get to do just what these lab kits are built from because everybody's on a tight budget. Um, with the combination of virtual 3D augmented realities, 
um, virtual realities, you name it, as well as these virtual labs and things like that. The students can get the experience, they can get it through that simulation, they can still get the hands-on experience. Um, it may not be as perfect as what the physics professor thinks it is in his laboratory, um, the idea is for them to learn the concepts and apply concepts, collect data, um, learn how to number crunch that data, do the whole scientific methodology. Uh, the same thing with working with their computers and programming, they can still do that and they can get that experience. Even if you're teaching as a hybrid, um, there are great hybrid courses out there where all the lecture material is online and then the students do get to come in and work in the lab to uh, whether it's a mechanical engineering lab or an electrical engineering lab or something like that. So you can get that experience. Um, there are challenges, there are safety issues. Um, there are those things where maybe when they are in the upper division courses, you need them to get that hands-on experience with that multi-million dollar piece of equipment or whatever. But for those gateway courses, what they need is that thought process. They need that, that whole, you know, what is it that a scientist has to do to think through the problem solving? Um, how do you solve that problem? How do you analyze the data? How do you collect that data? That stuff they can get with that hands-on experience with, with the lab kit in combination with the virtual labs and some balance thereof. You can also send them on virtual uh, field trips or even field trips down, you know, I did it a lot with my courses. I said, okay, find a park, nearby, you're going to go and make some observations with some squirrels or some birds, you're going to do some things with trees, you're going to, you know, count the number of weeds in a quadrat or something like that, and they can step outside of their home and do it as well. There's ways to get around the, you have to be in the laboratory all the time to do it. So I'm not going to stay on my soapbox, but I do have a very tall soapbox that I get on when it comes to, to the, the challenges and how you can get around those challenges of, of digital transformation and, and those hands-on experiences. I'd love for you all to jump in if you have something to say, you know, or contradict what I say or, or you know, add a throw, throw a wrench into it there. I think you nailed it. Yeah, I, that was great. I was just gonna say, you know, I, I think you can do both hands-on activities and digital activities. There's no reason why you, you have to choose one. Um, and, I also just see more and more, I mean, just watching my own children go through school and college, um, more and more of, of the lab was, was digital. Um, and, and so even in, in medical sciences, you know, we have a, a medical school at the University of Mississippi, it's a fantastic. And a lot of that medical education is, is digital. Um, you know, it's it's not all, they're, they're still working with cadavers, sure, but <laughs> there's still a lot of technology involved in um, very hands-on careers. Um, so I, I think you just can't get away from it. Technology, we'd actually be remiss if we didn't acclimate students to the technology in a, in a particular discipline, because that's the future for a lot of disciplines. And, and cadavers are expensive. So you really, it's easier if you can say, let's get some simulations going here. I know that Case Western University and the Cleveland Clinic have really been on the forefront of using holographic imagery, um, whether it's through augmented reality or these holograms that they manipulate. And you, you tear your cadaver, your virtual cadaver apart first. And that way you're not messing up this really expensive cadaver that has that human side that you've always got to be contending with, that ethical and human side that you've got to contend with. Practice on the simulated hologram first and, and really get more comfortable with it. Um, and if they're able to do it in med schools, I'm not sure why there's such a, a wall that we've created that, well, you can't do it in an engineering class. You can't do it in a physics class. You can't do it in a biology class because you can. We just got to get, we ask our students to be innovative, but we as educators need to be innovative as well. So, um, we just have a few more minutes left, so I, I want to kind of take a step back to your all's um, student fellows program and a question, you know, you were talking about bringing student voice in and that student agency, and that was something that you all stepped into last year. So could you kind of reiterate and expand upon why is it important to bring that, um, that student voice into the professional development programs when you're working with these faculty, when you're working with the instructional designers? What is that link there and why is it so important to bring that student voice into that, that course redesign process or into the, the teaching and learning programs? 
Um, I think one reason is because at the core of equity work is really um, redistribution of power, right? Or right, right sizing that imbalance of power. And I think that one way that you redistribute that power is to bring your students to the table and allow them to have a say, allow them to have a perspective, because I think historically that has been something that, you know, we, we haven't allowed. And um, I think when you really step back and think about it, like I said in my remarks, you know, we're designing for students, right, without actually including them at all. Um, and that that's a tremendous that, you know, that says a lot about the power and the privilege that we're entering into this work with, you know, to be able to design something to solve a problem for someone without even talking to them, without even involving them in that in that solution process. And so I think that the way that we make that right is by um, bringing our students as a part of a, a part of the solution, but doing so in a way that's real and meaningful. A big thing that we we continue to challenge ourselves, uh, you know, with in our program is you know, not tokenizing our students, right? So not just kind of putting them out front and having them read a script or having them say what we want them to say or giving them a seat at the table, but that's about it. We really want them to feel like they have the power to make change. That they really have the power, you know, to tell us what we don't want to hear. And, and you know, we have to take that in. Um, so for us, you know, that's that's what why it's so important. Patty, do you want to add to that real quick? We've got just a couple minutes left. I'll just tell an anecdote. When we were running focus groups with students, they were course-based because we, we were part of the adaptive courseware grant and we wanted to know the student experience of these adaptive courseware implementations in particular classes. And I remember one of the first ones we ran, it was in a mathematics class, college algebra. And we had a group of about six students in the focus group. And, you know, we started asking questions and one of the students started crying. And I was really concerned that we were doing it wrong. And it was my first time doing focus groups. And I asked her if she was okay. And she said, no one's ever asked me before what it's like to be a student. No one's ever asked me, like, when you do something in the classroom, what do I think about it? And she's like, I just, I'm, I'm just kind of overwhelmed at, the fact that you even care what I think. She's like, I'm just used to things being done to me in class and, and not having anyone ask what it was like for me to have those things implemented. So that to me really kind of was a moment that spoke to why we need to have student voice. That's a, that's a great antidote to end on. Um, so I would like to thank all of our attendees for coming to the session and, and hearing about the transformation that Every Learner Everywhere is working on with these institutions. A huge thank you to Patty and to Jessica for presenting and, and helping us understand where things are going and where things can go. We did record this session. It will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Um, I would like to bring your attention to the survey that should have popped up in your feed loop window. Uh, we would really appreciate you answering those questions for us. It's it's not only good for WCET, but it's really good for our, um, our presenters to get to see what you all have to say about it. And our next group of sessions will be coming up shortly. So please join us. There's uh, five sessions coming up for you to choose from. And we really do thank you for your, your time and your listening to us and, and coming to learn from us. So you all have a great day. <laughs>